Um, we left off in uh, Matthew 16. As you know, we go verse by verse through God's Word, and we're in Matthew 16. Uh, the disciples are up in the northern region, um, Caesarea Philippi, a beautiful place about 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee, uh, below Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is the one of the highest mountains there. It's 9,200 feet. It's usually snow-capped. And it's basically the, the main source of water that feeds the Jordan River. And so it's up in this region that Jesus asks his disciples two very important questions. And we looked at these last week. We got to verse 15, but we're going to uh, back up a little bit, circle back. And uh, so let's, um, <laughs> some of you got that. Anyway, let's pray. Father, <clears throat> we come before you and we just thank you for your word, we do pray that you would draw us close to you. We thank you that your word is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And Lord, we need to have ears to hear what your spirit is saying. Lord, may I decrease, may you increase, and may we have uh, just hearts to receive what you have for us. Lord, we thank you that you are here in our midst, wherever two or three are gathered together in your name. You are here among us, and we thank you, Jesus. You are the guest of honor, and we pray that we would... Um, glorify you, bless you in all that we say and do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Matthew 16, let's pick up in verse 13 again. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he, ha he asked his disciples saying, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Now again, it's interesting, as I mentioned last time, how uh, different people look at Jesus through a different lens. They see him in different ways, and people still do that with Jesus today. You know, they're saying, some say you're like John the Baptist. Well, John the Baptist was politically minded in some ways. He called out King Herod Antipas, you know, you're an adulterer, you're with your brother's wife, and he just got on his case, and he ended up in prison because of it. So there's a lot of Christians that are like that. They're very involved politically. Some say, you're Elijah. Well, Elijah walked in the power of God, and a lot of Christians, you know, they want to see the power of God on display. Nothing wrong with that. Um, others say, you're Jeremiah. Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet. He was burdened by the sins of the people and the destruction that was going to come upon Jerusalem and uh, Israel just because of the rebellion against God. And so he was the weeping prophet. And so, um, you know, the same thing. There's a lot of people, in, you know, there are Christians that go around and they're very burdened down because our culture, our cities, our nation, the world is real, literally going to hell in a handbasket, you might say. And so, yeah, there's a lot of people burdened down. Again, that's okay. All these godly men mentioned here, John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, they were created by God and none of them are the same just like all of us, and in various ways they reflected Christ, but none of them were Jesus, but they certainly represented some aspect of Jesus. Jesus got angry at the corrupt religious leaders in Israel. He flips over the money changers' tables. You know, he calls them out. He says of Herod, he's a fox, which is not a good term. He was being, you know, he was upset with him. He certainly demonstrated the power of God. Obviously, we've seen that throughout Matthew, where he uh, heals the sick, cleanses lepers, casts out demons, raises people from the dead. And on occasion, Jesus wept. He's, he, you know, he sees the results of sin, like when he comes to the tomb of Lazarus, and he began to weep. Uh, when he's coming into Jerusalem, in his triumphal entry, it says that he wept over Jerusalem because he knew what was going to happen as a result of them rejecting Jesus as Lord and Savior. And because we are created in the image and likeness of Christ, we will experience a wide range of emotions as we live in this fallen world. But we are just little reflectors of Christ. And Jesus is the ultimate light of the world. And so you can't capture Jesus in just one person. Oh, he's like this, he's like that. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He's the great God and Savior. And that brings us to verse 15, where we saw last week. He said to them, the all-important question, 
But who do you say that I am? Again, who do you say Jesus Christ is? When you're alone in your home, who are you saying Jesus Christ is? That should not be a fearful thing to answer, but it should cause us to rejoice, to be able to answer him and say, Oh, Lord, you are my Savior. You're my Redeemer. And I thank you, Jesus, for saving a wretch like me. I mean, I've been saved over 45 years now, and you still love me? That's awesome. I mean, God is so good. He's constantly showering us with his grace and forgiveness and mercy. So we should not be afraid to bring everything to Jesus. After all, he alone is perfect. All of us are far from perfect, and he certainly knows how imperfect we are, and yet Jesus still loves us. So he asks you, who do you say that I am? Now, of all the disciples, guess who's the first one to blurt out an answer? Peter, right? Look at verse 16. Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Ding, ding, ding. That's the correct answer, Peter. Yay. You're the Christ. That means you are the promised one. You are the anointed one of God. The Son of the living God. In other words, you're the only begotten Son of God. And that literally means you're God, you're God come in human flesh. He is correct. Verse 17 Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, Bar meaning son of, so Simon son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So here Jesus calls Peter blessed because the Father has made known to Peter who Jesus Christ is. In other words, Peter did not figure this out on his own. But this is a supernatural revelation from God to Peter. By the way, this is how all of us have come to know the truth of who Jesus is. We didn't figure him out. How do you figure out the creator of the heavens and the earth? How do you create, you know, figure out the great I am? We didn't figure Jesus out, but the Holy Spirit was at work convicting us of our sin, showing us who Jesus is, bringing the word of God to life showing us how unrighteous we are, telling us that if we continue down this same path of sin and rebellion, we're going to face the consequences of our actions. And even if our actions were not that bad, the Holy Spirit revealed to us that we're still sinners in God's eyes, and we need the Savior, and the Holy Spirit's always pointing people to Jesus. This is why the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But then we have Romans 6.23, which tells us, For the wages of sin is death. That's what we all deserve. That's what we've all earned. I want to be paid for my work. Well, here's your wages for being a sinner. <laughs> death. But the gift, and it literally means the free gift of God, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then Romans 10.13 says, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so we say, or this is why we say salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is from the Lord. We can never figure this out on our own, but the Holy Spirit opens up our eyes to the truth, to the reality of who Jesus Christ is, what he has done for sinners like us. But then we have a decision to make. Are we going to yield our lives to the Lord? Are we going to receive him, believe in him, trust him alone for salvation, or like I did for many, many years and probably 25 times when I heard the clear gospel message, push God away. Say, I don't want to hear it. Get out of my face. Leave me alone. We say thanks, but no thanks. I, I love how Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 says it. It says, in him, that's in Jesus, you also trusted when? After you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. So after you heard the word of truth, after you heard the gospel of your salvation, that's when you trusted. In whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. So God has done everything for our salvation. All we can do is believe, is trust in Him for eternal life. Amazing. We come now to one of the most controversial verses, but one of the most important verses in 
Matthew, in the Bible, really, verse 18. So after he says, you're blessed, the Father revealed this to you, and then Jesus says, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now, the only reason this verse is controversial is because the Catholic Church interprets this to mean that Jesus is going to build his church on Peter. He's the infallible first pope. He's the vicar of Christ. And when you hear that term, the vicar of Christ, what they call the pope today, the, the vicar simply means he is the representative on earth of Jesus. Eh, not true. That is a bad interpretation for many reasons. First of all, Peter was far from infallible. In fact, in a few verses, Peter's going to take Jesus aside and rebuke Jesus. And then Jesus is going to say, get behind me, Satan. And then later on, Peter's going to deny the Lord three times the night of his crucifixion. And even though some might argue, well, that was before Pentecost. That's before he's filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Well, years after Pentecost, Peter goes up to Galatia, and he's there with the Apostle Paul. And then these Judaizers come up, and you, re you can read about it in Galatians 2, where Paul gets in his face and calls him out as a hypocrite. So he was far from infallible. Jesus would never build his church on a fallible, imperfect person like Peter or Paul or John or any of us. There's no way he would ever do that. But the fact of the matter is Jesus built his church on Peter's confession of who he said Jesus was. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And a simple understanding of the Greek words that Jesus uses here makes it very clear. In other words, Jesus used a play on words when he mentions Peter's name. When Jesus says, I also say to you that you are Peter, the word Peter in the Greek is Petros. It means a little stone. That's very clear. It's a little stone, Petros. Upon this rock, I'll build my church. Rock is a massive, giant rock or stone. And so Jesus Christ, who he is, that's the massive rock upon which he would build his church. In fact, the Bible is clear that Jesus is the rock upon which we stand. He's the rock of our salvation. He's the chief cornerstone. He's the immovable rock. For those of us who have been to Caesarea Philippi, we get a perfect visual of this. Check it out, this picture of Caesarea Philippi. And uh, it's a great illustration that Jesus used in this verse. There's a stream that, okay, this is Caesarea Philippi where that little hole is on the bottom of the massive rock there, water comes out, and you see the water flowing. That goes into the Sea of Galilee. That's the headwaters of the Jordan River. And so all along that stream, and in the stream are these little stones. That rock is a massive Petra. So you can just picture Jesus. He's right there, and he's like, Peter, you're like this little stone. But on that massive rock, I will build my church. That's the difference. That's what it boils down to. So it's easy to see Jesus saying this to Peter. Now, again, the Bible is clear that Jesus is the rock. He's the foundation upon which we build our lives, upon which his church is built. Look at these verses, Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are justice, a God of truth and without injustice. Righteous and upright is he. There's Isaiah 44, verse 8. Do not fear, this is the Lord speaking, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. That's a great verse to use with the Mormons, by the way. You know, that claims there's millions and millions of gods out there, but the one true God says, is there a God besides me? I know not one. Whoa, well, he's not very smart then. If he doesn't know of all the millions out there, no, that's there's one God. There's one rock. Paul makes a statement about Jesus being the rock. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 4. This is where Paul is talking about examples from the Old Testament. He says, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Even Peter acknowledges that Jesus is the rock. 
So Peter knows he's not the rock upon which the church is built. When, when you read through first, or, um, yeah, first Peter chapter 2, the first half of that chapter, three times he calls Jesus the rock. He says he is the chief cornerstone, he's the stone the builders rejected, and he's the rock of offense. So Peter knew, as well as anybody, that he's not the rock, Jesus is the rock. And so the statement of faith by Peter is the rock. This Jesus is the rock upon which we build. Paul says it like this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. He writes, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And so we build our lives on Jesus. And Paul goes on to say, Be careful, take heed how you build upon that foundation. And he talks about building with gold, silver, precious stones. He says, hay, wood, and stubble, straw. In other words, everything we do as Christians in the power of the Holy Spirit is like gold, silver, precious stones. Everything we do as Christians that is not in the power of the Holy Spirit, like, I, I want to be noticed by people, that's why I'm doing this, then that's hay, wood, and stubble. And you go before the refiner's fire, we'll see this next time, and all the stuff we do in the flesh as believers is going to be burned up. It'll be a pile of ashes. Remember what those, uh, or what Jesus tells those who build on the sand? We saw it back in chapter 7. He goes, don't build your house on the sandy land. Don't build it too near the shore. Remember that song? I don't remember who did it. Anyway, so Jesus said, don't build your house in the sand because when the wind and waves hit, it's going to all crumble. It's all going to be destroyed. You build your house on the rock. Jesus is the rock. So when the storms of life hit you, you will stand. So any church, any denomination that builds upon anyone or anything other than Jesus is building on the sand and not the rock. Notice also here in verse 18. This is a very important verse. That's why we're breaking it down. Jesus says, on this rock I will build my church. In other words, the true church is Jesus' church. It's not my church. It's His church. I'm not building His church, and it's not Jesus building my church. Jesus is building His church. That's very important. By the way, this is the first time the word church is mentioned in the New Testament. The Greek word is ekklesia. Ek means to be taken from. Um, kaleo means to be uh, taken from, to become a gathering or an assembly. So we are taken from this world, put together by Jesus to be an assembly of believers who trust Him with all of our hearts. Spiritually speaking, He's creating an assembly of people from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, this is something new. This is something different from anything that the religions of the world had ever seen because Jesus is uniting people in His body, in His church, from every background. You know, we've talked about this verse a lot in Galatians 3.28. In Christ there's neither Jew or Gentile, male or female, bond or free. We're all one in Christ. He breaks down all those barriers. And because in His church... He unites everybody into this new building, this new temple, this new body. He's the builder. He's the architect. He's the head of his body, the church. Paul says of the church, it is the pillar and the foundation of what? Truth. That's what the church is supposed to be. That's what we are supposed to be doing sharing the truth about Jesus from His Word. That's the pillar and foundation. That's the most important thing about the church is bringing out what the Scriptures say, who Jesus Christ is, what He has done. How can This is an interesting question for the days in which we live. How can we be culturally relevant if we've been called out of this world, this wicked culture, how can we, should we be culturally relevant? My answer is no. We're not to be culturally like the world around us. We've been taken out of the world. We're supposed to influence the world to be more like Jesus, to come to Christ for salvation. I think the biggest reason the church has become so ineffective in these days, because we're like the Laodicean church in Revelation 3, is that we're trying to be just like the world around us. But we're to be distinct. We're to be unique. 
from the world. We're the called out ones. We're not called the partners of everything ones. We're the called out ones. The more hip and cool and culturally relevant Christians and churches try to become, the less effective we become for the kingdom of God. Yes, we want to identify with people around us, but we'll get into that in a moment. Jesus told us that we are the salt. He says we are the light. You don't put the light under a basket. I don't want to offend anybody. i got to be careful around unbelievers. I don't want to scare them off as they wander off into the lake of fire. Come on. The salt, if it loses its saltiness, its flavor of who Jesus is, it's good for nothing, he says, but to be trampled under the foot of men. In that same teaching, he finishes it off by saying in Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And the main way we shine the light of Jesus in this world is to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit allowing the Holy Spirit to produce His fruit of love, joy, peace within our lives. The fruit of agape love has to be first and foremost. Again, Jesus says in John 13, 34, A new commandment I give to you that you love, agape, one another, as I have loved you, that's unconditionally, that you also love one another. By this... By His love working in us and through us, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That's when the world gets a taste of what genuine Christianity is all about. Not by us watering down the Word of God. Not by us saying, I don't really want to preach the gospel. I don't want to offend people. But it's by us walking in the light as Jesus is in the light. It's by us walking according to the truth of His Word, not compromising the Scriptures by us walking in the power of the Holy Spirit so people will see more of Jesus and less of us. That's the bottom line. We want them to see Jesus. And Jesus isn't going to back off and just water it down. He's going to let people know, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. I love you so much, I died on the cross for your sins. I shed my blood. I took God's wrath upon me so that you could be set free. We don't water that down. Jesus says, I will build my church. Again, it's his church. It's not the Pope's church. It's not Pastor so and so church. And I've heard people say, Oh, you ever been to Pastor Jeff's church? Don't say that. It's not my church or Pastor Ben's church. No, it's not his church. It's Jesus' church. And when we have that proper perspective, then we should all do things for his glory and not for our glory. Now, look at the last phrase here in verse 18. He makes this great promise about his church, his bride. He says, and the gates of Hades, I know the old King James says hell, but it's literally the gates of Hades, shall not prevail against it. Again, this is one of those sections a lot of people interpret many different ways. Some say, hey, we're the Lord's army. We're going to go kick the gates of hell down. It's not exactly what it means. Some look at it as if the gates of hell are going to be chasing after us. They're going to knock us off. No, gates don't do that. In biblical times, city gates were the places where the religious leaders, the civic leaders, they would gather at the gate and they would strategize. They would plan, how are we going to do our thing in this city? How are we going to govern? The gates of Hades, that's the place where strategies of the enemy are planned out how to try to come against mankind. The gates of Hades. Hades was the place of the dead. In the Old Testament, it's known as Sheol. Revelation 20, verse 14, at the end of the age, this is after the millennial reign of Christ, a thousand-year reign, it says, Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire, this is the second death. So it's a real literal place, the place of the dead. So what Jesus is saying here is that the strategies, the plans of death will no longer prevail against those who are members of my church, those who belong to me, those who are my bride, my body. So that means that um, the organized power of death and Satan 
would be conquered by Jesus. How? In his death, in his burial, in his resurrection. In other words, they would no longer have any power over any of us who've been called out of this world. We are his church, and Jesus did that by saving us. This is why verses like 1 John 4, 4 are so wonderful to grab hold on, because John writes, you are of God, speaking to the body of Christ. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So he who is in you, Jesus, is greater than anyone, anything, Satan. That's why they will not prevail against us because greater is he that's in us. I love the way that... Uh, Hebrews 2, 14 and 15 sums it up. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, so we have a body of flesh and blood, he himself, Jesus himself, likewise shared in the same. That's why he came from heaven to earth, born in a manger, took on a human body, so he shared in the same. That through death, his death on the cross, he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So Jesus is saying death has no power over you any longer. You don't need to fear death because I have conquered death. Because I rose from the dead and because you are now washed clean in my blood because I have given you everlasting life. Then that means you will never die. You have eternal life. That's good news. The, you know, hell, the gates of Hades, death shall not, cannot prevail against you because we are new creations in Christ. That's what it boils down to. This is exactly what Jesus says. And I quote these verses at every funeral I do. John eleven twenty five. Jesus said to her, this is when Martha you know, is there and she's upset because her brother Lazarus had died. Jesus waited a couple days longer at the Jordan River and he comes up there and now Lazarus is dead for four days. And the old King James, I love it, says, by now he stinketh. So anyway, Jesus said to her, Martha, about Lazarus being dead, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Now here's the kicker. And whoever lives, like us right now, and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? That's important. Whoever lives and believes in me. For us, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. As soon as we take our last breath here on earth, we're in the presence of the Lord. That means we'll never die. Physically, yeah, you'll croak, maybe, at some point. But when you die, you're instantly in his presence. So you don't die. That's what Jesus says. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe that the gates of Hades shall not prevail against you? That's what it means. So what a glorious promise that we have passed from death to life. No matter how many plans the forces of darkness come up with, they will not, they cannot prevail against Jesus and his church, his bride, his body, you and me. We have a destiny with Jesus in glory. And he is coming for his bride. And nobody is going to keep us from being with him forever and ever. I love the way Jesus says it in John 10, verse 27 and 28. You're familiar with these verses. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. Meh. Okay, Lord. So we're his sheep. He's the chief shepherd. And I know them and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Praise the Lord. You are safe and secure in Christ. So look at verse 19 then. Another controversial verse. And I will give you, and the you there is singular. He's speaking to Peter here. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, this is one of those verses people have misapplied or misinterpreted. Again, he is speaking directly to Peter. I'm giving you, Peter, the, kings, uh, the keys to the kingdom of heaven. But don't, in this or this character of Peter standing at the pearly gates. <laughs> yeah, you can come in. Uh -uh, you're not allowed. That's not anywhere in Scripture. Peter is not doing that. 
He's not at standing any pearly gates saying, you get in, you don't get in. But keys are basically a badge of authority. We use keys to open doors. Jesus gave Peter the exclusive privilege of opening the door of faith to the Jewish people first. Uh, Acts chapter 2, day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 8, he opens the door of faith to the Samaritans. And then in Acts chapter 10, he opens the door of faith to the Gentiles. Just like Jesus said, you know, you'll be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. So Peter had that privilege. But when we get to chapter 18, we know that Jesus will give these same keys to all the apostles. The Apostle Paul has the same key. What is the key, by the way, that opens the door of faith? It's the gospel. It's the simple gospel message of who Jesus is, why he went to the cross, shed his blood for us, he rose from the dead. He alone can give you everlasting life if you'll put your faith and trust in him. Paul says it like this in 2 Corinthians 2.12, Furthermore, when I came to Troas... To preach, notice, Christ's gospel, a door was opened to me by the Lord. Again, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. These keys of the kingdom have been entrusted to every single one of us as well. Jesus has given you and me the good news, the gospel. And when we share the good news, that will open up doors for people to come to faith in Christ if they receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. He wants all of us, His saints, to be faithful stewards of all the blessings He has given us. And He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing, but especially the gospel of Christ. This also applies to this statement where He talks about binding and loosing. This is not talking about Christians running around, I bind Satan in Jesus' name. I bind all the demons over San Francisco in Jesus' name. You think San Francisco has been impacted by that? No. It's worse off than ever. Satan is not bound by any of us. He's not loosed by any of us. We can't go around binding demons. That's not what it's referring to at all. This refers to the authority we have to declare the gospel. In other words, when we proclaim Christ, we have the authority to let people know, if you place your faith in Jesus, you'll be loosed from the powers of darkness, and you will come into the kingdom of God. You can have eternal life. He will save you because He loves you, and you'll be released from the bondage of death and Hades. If that person rejects the gospel of Christ, like I did probably 25 times before I got saved, we have the authority to let them know. You reject Jesus, you're still in your sins. You're, you're still in captivity to the enemy's lies. You're still on a fast track to Hades, to the lake of fire, however you want to put it. You're still lost in your sins unless you turn to Christ and repent. This is also true when it comes to Christians that get caught up in any sinful, unbiblical habit or stuff or wickedness. We have the authority from God's Word to go to that Christian and say, you know what? The Bible says don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Don't be dating somebody that's an atheist or doesn't love Jesus with all their heart. Don't do that. The Bible says don't be unequally yoked. The Bible says you will reap what you sow. You sow to the flesh, Christian, of the flesh you will reap corruption. It's very clear. We have that authority to warn our brothers and sisters if we see them getting caught up in things that are not biblical. When we proclaim God's word in power and in love, what we say has already been established in heaven. All we're doing by binding and loosing is reaffirming what God's word has established as fact. So, Look at verse 20. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. So he's telling the apostles, commanding them, you, don't, you know who I am. I don't want any of you telling anybody who I am. Well, that seems counterintuitive. I mean, he wants us to take the gospel all over the world. Why is he saying don't tell anybody? Because he know right now before Pentecost they're going to mess it up. 
They're going to say all kinds of stupid things to people. They're going to get it all twisted. He's saying, I don't want you guys as my PR men just yet. Wait till after the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and then you'll be my witnesses. But not now. I mean, right now, Peter's going to deny knowing Jesus. We're in the last six to eight months of his earthly ministry. Peter's going to whack off Malchus's ear as they're arresting him. The disciples are all going to flee. Just in a little while, we're going to see they're arguing with one another. I'm better than you. Who's greatest in the kingdom of heaven? I'm, I should be sitting at your right hand and left hand. That's what James and John said. I mean, these guys are not ready yet. Jesus is letting them know, I'll tell you when it's okay to be my witnesses. And he does. At the end of Luke's gospel, the beginning of Acts, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, then you'll be my witnesses. So it says in verse 21, from that time, this is when Jesus really starts honing in on his purpose for coming from heaven to earth. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Now again, we're in the last six, eight months of his earthly ministry, and up to this point, everything's been one amazing adventure after another for the disciples. I mean, they're seeing him, you know, all these miracles, raising people from the dead, feeding 5,000 Jewish men, plus their wives and kids with a little Lunchable. I mean, these guys are just blowing, oh, this is wonderful, this is great, we love this. He's been blowing their minds for about two and a half years at this point, but they still haven't grasped the main reason why he came from heaven to earth. They're still thinking, any moment now, he's going to kick out the Romans and establish the kingdom of heaven on earth. That's what's in their minds. And even though John the Baptist said Jesus was the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, they couldn't fathom anybody stopping Jesus or anything stopping Jesus. And we know nothing could, but Jesus will tell us, I give my life willingly. I lay down my life. Nobody takes it from me. I mean, he was willingly giving his life to be that sacrifice. So it's from that time, this moment, Jesus really started to tell them, I must go to Jerusalem, I must be beaten and tortured, I must be crucified, and I must rise from the dead. And he'll tell them over and over again. And they never got the resurrection part. It just took a long time for them to figure that out. Because even after he rose from the dead, and, you know, Mary Magdalene and the women tell him, we saw Jesus raised from... Oh, no, you didn't. I mean, these guys were just knuckleheads like me. Anyway, again, this is why Jesus came to earth. He had to be that sacrificial lamb, the perfect spotless lamb of God, the one who would die in our place, taking upon himself all the wrath and judgment we deserve for our sins. He shed his blood so that we could be cleansed and forgiven, and saved, and delivered from death in Hades. So he says, this is what's going to happen, guys. Look at verse 23. But he turned, or verse 22, sorry. Then Peter took him aside. This picture, come here, Jesus. You're talking about this death and stuff. Come over here. i got to straighten you out. He turned and said to, uh, then Peter took him aside and, said, and began to rebuke him. Can you imagine rebuking Jesus? saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. I mean, this is incredible. I mean, Jesus just told him, Simon of Arjona, flesh and blood is not revealed. You got a supernatural revelation from our Father in heaven. And, and so as Peter and his disciples are listening to Jesus, telling them about his torture, his death in Jerusalem, Peter's like, somebody's got to straighten him out. He's, he's losing it. He's out of his mind. It might as well be me since God speaks to me. So Peter goes up to him, pulls him aside. Can you imagine? Jesus, quit talking like that. You're talking nonsense. You're the Christ. I just told you you're the son of the living God. So snap out of it. Verse 23, But he, Jesus, turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Now, of all the things Jesus could say to us, this has got to be the very last thing you would ever want to hear from him. Get behind me, Satan. Why does he say this to Peter? 
Because Peter is thinking just like Satan. He's saying what Satan said during the temptation. Remember back in chapter 4? You don't have to die. All you have to do is bow down and worship me, Jesus, and I'll give you, it says, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. That's when Jesus rebuked Satan. Get behind me, Satan. It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Listen, both Satan and Peter encourage Jesus to take the easy way out. You don't have to go to the cross. Why would you do that? You, need, you, you should just do whatever you want to do. You're the Messiah. He had to go to the cross. There's no options. There's no other way. That was the only plan from eternity past, from the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. Jesus, you have to go down there. You have to die. You have to shed your blood because that blood is the only acceptable payment for the sins of the world. And so by trying to say, you don't need to do that, Jesus, Peter's saying, hey, there's got to be a shortcut. There is no shortcut. You can never save yourself. You can never die for your sins. You can never earn your way to heaven. That's why he says, get behind me, Satan. That's a lie of Satan in the Garden of Eden when he tells Adam and Eve, surely you won't die. You'll become just like God if you eat of this forbidden fruit. Nope. No shortcut whatsoever. Jesus must die. For the sins of the world. He must shed his blood for you, for me, for all of us. And his blood is sufficient to cleanse us of all sin, any sin, no matter what we've done. He's willing to forgive you. If you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, just recognize he did everything. That's hopefully the Holy Spirit's reminding you of this right now, speaking to your heart, that Jesus did everything to save you. He demonstrated his own love toward you. While we were still in our sins, Christ died for us. There's none righteous. We're all sinners. No, not one of us is righteous. But Jesus came to lay down his life, shed his blood as the only acceptable payment for our sins. And if anyone will come to him and say, Lord, I'm toast. Lord, I'm a sinner. I cannot save myself. But Lord, I recognize now you love me. You died in my place. You shed your blood for me. All you have to do is open up your heart and say, Jesus, I receive you. I believe in you. I trust what your word says. You alone are the Messiah. You alone are the way, the truth, and the life. No one will come to the Father but through you, Jesus. And I need you. And he is faithful. You know, it doesn't take some big, long prayer you got to write something out and maybe he'll hear no jesus you know one of my favorite verses revelation 320 it's the church of laodicea they basically ran him out because we we're wealthy we're we're in need of nothing we don't need jesus even so it says he's on the outside of the church knocking on the door it says if anyone and that's not speaking everyone in the church he's saying if there's anyone in there one person Speaking directly to one of you, if you don't know Christ, he says, if anyone will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. I will dine with him. I will partake of everlasting life. I'll give you my life. And you can go to heaven when your life on earth is done. If anyone will open the door and hear my voice, I will dine with him and he with me. That means fellowship forever and ever.